Bose is the presenting partner of Beyond the Grid. That's because Bose QuietComfort 35.2 goes beyond what you would expect from a pair of headphones. Just flip the switch to experience the industry-leading active noise reduction feature and all distractions of the world around you fade away, allowing you to focus fully on what matters to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Eddie Jordan, and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. This week's guest is a giant killer. He's a man with a big personality who, as a team owner, regularly inflicted pain on much bigger and better funded rivals. And he continues to pull no punches today as a broadcaster on British TV. Eddie Jordan is his name, and he's been there and he's done it, and he's done it the hard way. He founded his own F1 team from nothing. He started 250 Grand Prix, winning four of them, before selling up in 2004. Fittingly, I caught up with him in the Force India motorhome. Many of the guys who worked for him 25 years ago when his name was above the door are still there. And it took EJ a mighty long time to get to the meeting room on the first floor. So busy was he cajoling and bantering with his former employees. Eddie is an intriguing mix of funny and serious. And if you can keep up with his scattergun delivery, you'll enjoy the gems that come out during the course of our conversation. Well, Eddie, welcome to Beyond the Grid. Great to see you. It's been a while. Indeed. You're looking well. Um, now, you sold your team in 2004. Has life been better or worse for you since then? Wow, that's a good question. Um, certainly less stressful. Um, I did enjoy the Formula One, probably enjoyed Formula Three and 3000 more. Um, so that was, uh, if you like, the precursor to Formula One of 16 years there or thereabouts. Uh, since then, I've done all sorts of other things. Um, gone slightly back to my roots, uh, banking. I was on the board of Citibank for a long time, Clairville Capital and many other little things. Uh, and I've enjoyed that as well. But, you know, as I've now turned the corner of 70, believe it or not, Tom, which is uh, no bad thing, um, I'm sort of becoming much more involved and integrated with the family, the grandkids, and uh, spending more time with them. So I'm not going to pick out which was more important to me at any one time or not. It's just to say I'm extremely happy with the life that I've had, and I don't think I would change a day of it. Well, when you look back, what's the overriding feeling about your time in Formula One? Well, um, in my day in Formula One, is very different to what it is now. And the reason I say that, and I'm not saying it's better or worse, I'm just saying it was very different. Because you had the likes of the Ken Tyrrells and the Frank Williams, Ron Dennis, myself, Tom Walkinshaw. So you had the Alan Pross and Guy Ligier. You had LaRousse. You had all the people whose name was above the door. They were the people who were taking the risk. And they were the entrepreneurs, if you want to call them that, uh, they were the people who had this belief, had this mindset that they could achieve uh, certain levels of success in Formula One, and, and it was their team. Um, and if you like, the buck stopped with them. Now it's different, isn't it? It's uh, much more corporate. You've got major, major manufacturers, the likes of Mercedes, the likes of Renault, uh, Fiat and Ferrari, of course. And you've got Honda and many other people who are looking at the sport. And we hear about names like Porsches and that. So it has changed. So the dynamics, people are inclined to be employed. Um, and there's always somebody to pick up the bill, generally speaking. Whereas in my day, you had to have the money to pay and you could only spend it once and it had to be your money. So uh, different circumstances, different levels of stress. Could you have done it as a paid employee rather than being the owner? No, I don't think I was good enough. The reason I had to work for myself was because I don't think I was employable. Simple. I don't believe that. Well, I do because um, I, 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 I jump from one thing to another. Uh, I, I am lucky that I have good vision um, and I have a sense of feel that if I feel somebody either, I'm not talking about racing drivers, although some people will jump to that conclusion, you know, uh, 
if I think somebody is really good, will I be able to suss that out quicker than the next guy? Generally, that's one of the things that I'm lucky that I have. And that is, uh, Bernie also had it. He was a masterful uh, genius when it came to vision, seeing where his Grand Prix would go. I believe that I could see a racing driver quickly and see how I would adapt him and bring him into the team, whether it was, you know, that's why most of the drivers I had wound up at Ferrari, whether it was Alessi or Johansson or Michael himself, Barrichello, Irvine, Fisichella. You know, that, they were proud moments for me. So I gave all those guys a, a half-decent chance and they wound up with the prime, you know, the prime team to drive for. Brilliant. Tell me about this understanding of racing drivers because I think some people listening to this might not be aware that you were a racing driver and... A very good one until you broke your leg i would say i think you've been very nice to me you obviously <laughs> need this podcast more desperately than i thought you did but um i don't think i was good enough where i think i was extraordinarily lucky i was what's known as an irish blagger and i could blag my way better than most of the guys in the team but i certainly didn't have the same talent so when i uh, you know in the very early days of the um, end of the 70s um i, I got a chance uh, with Marlborough because the guy George Mackin thought that I had a lot f going for me whether as a driver or a marketeer or promotions or whatever it was and he took me out of Ireland and he put me in the same team would you believe as a couple of names that may people uh, may recall and that was um, young uh, Alan Prost, um, Nicky Lauda, James Hunt, Emerson Fittipaldi was there. So this was the Marlborough World Championship team. And I was at the very bottom of it. But you can see most of those guys became world champions. So the, the little snippets that you pick up along the way as to wh how he's doing this and how he approaches that. And, and, and you, you keep that in the memory bank for sure because you realize these guys are quicker than you and you want to know why. And then you suddenly realize, hey, listen, I better get out of here while the going is good. And the best thing for me, if I can't be a world champion racing driver, I sure as hell want to be a world champion team. But that was complete nonsense because I didn't have two quid to rub together. It was, you know, I was brassic. I must have been the maddest person on earth to undertake even starting a lowly Formula 4 team or a Formula 3 team, but that's how it happened. Well, look, we're going to come on to that, but I just, you as a racing driver, you don't win in Formula Atlantic, for example, if you're a complete lemon, and you did that, so you're being modest. Well, uh, yes, maybe modest in a certain context, but if you're talking about world-class I was never close to world, whereas the guys I was in the same team as were world class. Maybe not initially, but certainly as life went through its, its cycle, um, they became huge names in the sport. All right. And people that I still admire and still do things together with, whether it's Alain or Nicky or the people like that, I, I love so much being with them because we all know what we used to do. Well, let's talk about you as teammate to Stefan Johansson. All right. What was he doing differently in the car to you? What was the difference? Well, it was sometimes that he wasn't doing any different, but generally he was quicker. And uh, he was on the Marlborough World Championship team, and you saw what happened to him. He wound up in Ferrari, then went to McLaren. So, you know, he's probably one of the, the drivers that I... I was very disappointed in a way for Stefan because he, he, he should have won Grand Prix and, and didn't. Um, he had great chances in great cars uh, and I, I certainly know what he was like because I did two years with him uh, in the same team, same car, same team bosses, same everything uh, and my clear understanding about him is that uh, just that, that he just he believed but he just didn't put himself in the right place at the right time to maximise his talent. And that's so much of this game, isn't it? Right place, right time. Look at Fernando Alonso, a leave, leaving Formula One at the end of the year, having not won a race since 2013. Yeah, but I have different views about Fernando, and I think he's, put him, he's allowed himself to be put in that position. You know, when you think back uh, of the great years and double world champion with Benetton, and look at the teams that he's been with since then. Um, and to have not won a championship, never mind win a Grand Prix, it's kind of scandalous, isn't it? And I have to call to question, he may be one of the greatest and the quickest drivers of all time, and he's certainly to this day still one of the greatest racing drivers in a race. 
that you can ever, ever want to have in your car. But something is flawed, whether it's his management or him or whatever, whether he chased a dream that wasn't there or whether he chased some money that was, was there or not there. It's okay. I'm not sure. I'd love to sit down and speak to Fernando and, and, and try to find out why he hasn't won seven world titles because he certainly has the talent to do. Oh, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? But Eddie, let's wind the clock back a little bit if I can. We're going to talk about you being the Brassic team owner in a minute, but I'd love you to talk about why motor racing. I've read that there was pressure from your family for you to go into dentistry and then there was a bit of accountancy. Why this passion for first driving and then just the sport itself? Well, you know, we're talking quite a long time ago now, but Ireland was a very different country to what it is now. And there was a policy that you either followed your father's footsteps um, or... In your case, that would have been what? Well, my father was an accountant, but his father and his brothers were dentists, so that's where the dentistry comes from. Um, and so there was, that was a considered part of the, the Jordan DNA. Uh, and then, of course, the other alternative was to, to join the priesthood. And um, that didn't happen. Um, well, I, I was that ever likely? I think I would have made a very good priest. But anyway, um, that's your opinion. <laughs> Uh, Tom, the situation about dentistry was, yes, I could definitely move into that category, but it was so much easier for me to do the Institute of Bankers and also to do cost and management accountancy because I could work during the day in the bank, um, do the Institute, I'd be paid for it, do my carting, and also study at night and do the um, cost and management accountancy, which is what happened. And that's why I became a racing driver too late. Uh, I was well in my uh, 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 mid to late 20s before I made it to go to England on a professional level and that's not a, a, a good recommendation. We know what age Lewis started with and, and that's quite the other extreme of course. But, but to come racing and try to compete against all these big names at the age of 27, 28, it's a big task. And so th therefore at that stage as I was reaching 30 getting married, having four young kids, um, not all together immediately, but nevertheless they were there. Um, it kind of focuses your mind on other things, and that is, uh, where am I going to make my money as a racing driver in four years from now? And the answer was clearly mm, not, not obvious. So uh, I thought that if I made a start, I would be a much younger team boss. So if I started being a team boss in my 30s, the very early 30s, and started Formula Ford with, funny enough, James Hunt's brother, David. Um, and uh, then I moved on from there. So, 82, uh, it started. David Leslie, um, Martin Brundle, uh, it went on. We had some amazingly good drivers. Mauricio Sandro Sala, Johnny Herbert, who we won the championship with. So, I think you will find between Dick Bennett and myself, um, we basically dominated Formula 3. Uh, except I, I used to go to Europe at the same time Dick never did and as a result so when we would win in, in Europe um, he, uh, we, I used to slag him off and I said ah Dick you might be able to win in England but you can't win in <laughs> Europe <laughs> <laughs> he used to get really miffed but anyway that's life great competitor Dick brilliant now you mentioned some of the drivers who raced for you who was the best guy to sit in one of your cars well you know it's kind of uh, difficult because I don't want to be either over fair or, or not fair to some of the drivers. But there were two clearly that stand out and that was in 82. Um, there was a, a young kid, uh, he was doing Formula 4 2000 at the time. I had a Formula 3 car. I'd just been on pole the previous Sunday at Silverstone. So we did the test if you like, three days later on the Wednesday at Silverstone, and I asked this driver called the Silver, would he like to come and, and try a car for the afternoon? We had the afternoon free. And he came, and I don't know if you know too much about Formula 3, but uh, you know the air temperature changes, and, and it's about the, all about that little hole, uh, if you like, that makes the engine breed, and, and, and the, the crisper the air, the quicker generally the car should go. But this guy drove unbelievably quickly, and he, without much bother was quicker than what our pole position time was the previous three days um, we went to Macau with Dick Bennett he was one of the three guards Dick and I 
generally as a Marlborough team we joined together so we bought Brundle, Roberto Guerrero and this kid called De Silva he won the race and he changed his name to Ayrton Senna I mean it's part of folklore now so did Senna ever drive for me no but uh, Ayrton Senna De Silva did um, and the reality is that he he was the darling of the crowd and the reason for that is that he was able to embrace so many uh, particles of, of, of the sport um, uh, he, he could be very tough he could be very um, bordering on being rude to people but when he was concentrating what he needed to do and he put it in a, an unbelievable amount of hours he created a situation where he went through every particle of the car before the race to make sure that in his opinion it was the best car that you could ever have um, so that level of professionalism has now come up to Ert and Senna's level so he, he created that and um, so he was magic he was magic with the people he looked good the way he spoke was good uh, the girls loved him, the sponsors loved him, the teams loved him. So he was for sure one of the standout characters. Of course, you have to think about Michael Schumacher in the same vein. Um, Michael was much more successful in terms of purely uh, race championship wins. Um, and, you know, what he achieved, simply remarkable, particularly when you consider coming up to his 50th birthday. Um, and obviously we have for some time now we've all kept our fingers crossed in the hope that he would be able to make a full recovery but let's keep hoping let's keep hoping but anyway he was sensational and I would say that in terms of raw speed you would probably say that Schumacher might 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 have just had it uh, in o terms of race win no in, in terms of winning races and how to position himself and do the things in the car, uh, I think Michael just had it. But in terms of the overall lap and qualifying, I just, I don't know why, I, I feel Senna edged him. So they were very similar. I, honestly, there was nothing between them, nothing at all between them. Now, let's expand a little bit on that 1991 season when, when Schumacher did that race at Spa with you. But first of all, why Formula One? You'd had 16 very successful years in the junior categories. Why did you need the hassle of coming up to Formula One? You said you didn't have enough money. So Actually, if there was anyone sensible, they should have told me, they should have locked me in a room because honestly, it was the most stupid thing I've ever done. Because all well, I and did... And the best thing, Jules. Uh, no, because the stress level, you cannot imagine the amount of pressure and and... I think it's a well-known fact there are many levels and various different aspects of stress um, but uh, financial stress um, not being able to provide for the staff the suppliers your family kids school the whole lot that is a lot of pressure and when you don't have it and you've no idea where that money is coming from and you're still pursuing what some people may uh, consider an idiotic dream or selfish dream or you know self-centered people often used to say various different things about me and you have to be able to put up with that as well uh, I remember the first race um, when I first showed the car off it was a man that I admired greatly in Otto Hebdo called Jabi Krombach and he wrote a really lovely piece around the team but the last paragraph summed it all up and he said wonderful people lovely car may never see the light of day why do they bother? Now, that, I w you know, that's a long time ago. You know, what are we talking about? Well, that was 30 years ago. And I still remember each and every word of that sentence. Um, and Jabby Krobenbach, I owe him a lot because he drove me because I am going to show the people and you, Jabby Krobenbach, that you're wrong. I am going to make it. I am going to get the team on the grid. I am going to produce this car. And I am going to win Grand Prix. So, you know, in life you need certain people to drive you. And I believe that um, that ability to both embrace, cajole, uh, encourage, uh, whatever the words that you can think about that make the right comments. Um, of course, there are dark days and you think, God, what have I done? I'm putting everything at jeopardy, my own family, my own life, my own everything. And yet it came out the other side. So let us not be misled here. I have been the luckiest person on this planet for sure okay but when were you at your lowest ebb when you were setting the team up can you just give us paint a little picture how bad how desperate did things well, get it happened on a weekly basis the bailiff would call every friday 
I got I became first name terms with the bailiff. How and big I, were your debts? Give us can you give us well, some I, idea? I mean, would you know what? now in the scheme of things probably not but I just I will add to that in a second when I tell you but this bail, bailiff um, he became quite friendly with the team and he liked the team and he said look don't answer the door at 2.30 on Friday because I'd be coming to serve notice and if I can't get entry I can't get entry I said got the message no one would answer the door at 2.30 and he'd go away and he'd be whistling to himself now I'm sure that is the wrong image to give it but this was a really nice man and he knew that we would sort it out in time but what we just didn't need was yet another injunction anyway at that stage um it was around the time the michael schumacher had been to jordan and we lost him because people were saying we wouldn't have the money we were going to not be able to survive and so that was the kind of impression that jordan wasn't going to make it till the end of 91 and that was probably my lowest level um but Vickers took a different view and they went to the court and um, they got an order uh, which was a uh, winding up petition, um, very serious. A winding up petition is one of those things, when you come through the door, it kind of catches your attention. Do you know what I mean? You kind of say, hello, so by 12 o'clock tomorrow, if this money is not in the bank, we are closing you down. So that's a judgment coming from a judge and uh, it's an order 14. Uh, I can remember as clear as daylight, even though it's only you know it's a long number of years ago. But an order 14 and a winding up petition, they are things that uh, make sure that you have to attend to. And um, I, I, I remember very distinctly, I'd gone to Bernie many times looking for money to help me through it, and he owed me money from the television, but he said, I only owe you the money on the television if you can continue. And um, so we were able to continue. Um, he didn't want to give me any more money because he'd have a responsibility to the rest of the teams if I'd failed. So I remember ringing a friend of mine that I had been in the bank with and he was now kind of high flying. He had been to Harvard and he'd been working for Credit uh, Leonese or Agricole, one or the other at the time. And I said to him, listen, and make an Irish guy. I said, do you know anyone, any idiot in Ireland that might have a million quid that they could put up at the moment with the bank? Because I think I need that to keep everyone away from me just for now. He said, let me come and see. I said, look, I'm not going to do that because we know what we look like. Just tell me if you know anybody. But it has to be by, CHAP system is a, a banking term, so it had to be by two o'clock the following day through the, the clearing system, which is called CHAPS. And um, I was familiar with all this, so therefore I could see this ringing in my bell, how this was all going to unfold, how the journalists were going to write about it, and how, you know, this is my obituary in all of the, the, the different papers. Um, so I gave it one last shot, and, and Mick Tunney came to me, and um, I have no idea and don't know what he did, and I didn't sign anything, and it's all sort of part of the story. But anyway, he, he got the bank to put the judge in funds to the tune of a million quid, so we got a stay of execution. And as luck would have it... I that was all before the first Grand Prix? No, this is, this is at the end of the first yeah. year. Sorry. So when all the bills were building yeah. up. Yeah. So I got through the first year, but I was skint. Absolutely skint. Hadn't got a pot. And um, so 18 days, how lucky is this? So when I say I'm the luckiest person that ever walked this earth, I'm not joking you, it's true. So within 18 days, um, apartheid had finished in South Africa. Uh, Sassel and oil company were desperate to get on the world stage. They got certain incentives from the government in South Africa to get out and make sure that South Africa is open for worldwide business. And they saw that I knew people in Petrobras and they made oil out of uh, sugarcane and Sassel made oil out of coal and they wanted a collaboration and they asked me could I be able to help them and I said well obviously there'd have to be a consideration I said well we, we know about the consideration and they gave me six million quid to be sponsored with them the next year and I went to the board meeting in Johannesburg and they liked me so much they signed it for three years so I suddenly from having nothing I had 18 million and I mean that's how lucky I was you know but I got up off my chair. I have never sold a sponsor deal. I have never done anything sensible behind my desk. I've only ever done it out on the move. And that's what I would say to anyone. Don't hide yourself behind a desk. You're not going to make your business or make your fortune doing that. You've got to make yourself available and you've got to embrace the whole of your business and the people within the business and the people that are close to the business. Give yourself a chance. 
don't hide yourself away. Right, so it was dire straits then in 91. So when Bertrand Gachot had his altercation with a London taxi driver and you were looking for a driver for the Belgian Grand Prix, was it Schumacher you were interested in or was it the German Deutschmarks that were coming with him from Mercedes-Benz? I'm not sure I knew how to spell his name and I hadn't got the slightest interest in Michael Schumacher. And if you told me his name was Johnny Forbes, then that's what it was. I didn't care. I just cared about the team survival. And I needed the money. Uh, Mercedes through uh, Sauber had 150 to pay me per race to keep him in the seat. Um, $150,000. Yeah. It's very significant. And that money came way. through Sauber, do you say? Yeah, well, I'm not, listen, I'm not even at liberty to say it came from Mercedes. Of course it came from Mercedes, because Peter Selber wasn't paying it, was he? And um, so we can all fool ourselves. So I suppose, uh, go, even going back before that, there was a great legend of a man called Bert, Gert Kramer. And he had been pushing me, pushing me, Eddie, 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 you might have a seat if you have a seat. You've got to look at this guy, Michael Schumacher, he's the business. And I'm kind of bored with this altogether. I said, look, Gert, go away. Tell me what budget he has, and then I'll, I'll think about it. But, you know, please don't keep telling me how good he is. Tell me how much he's got. I mean, that's how brutal it is. Um, and um, so we did that. And, um, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Michael became a big star. I, I, I did well. Why didn't Michael. he become a big star with you? What happened there? Ah, well, it was clear. Bernie knew that I wouldn't make it to the end of the season. Probably no different. He could have been listening to the guys from Vickers and the guys from Ford. But it wasn't. didn't have to be Einstein to work it out. Jordan was living on fresh air. You know, we were... Uh, we, we certainly weren't sucking diesel. We were out to lunch. We were a bunch of Irish chancers. Chance in our arm, chance in our luck, and seeing what happens. And we tossed a coin, and it came up in our favour. We got lucky. There's no question about it. But Bernie wanted Michael Schumacher more than he wanted Jordan well, Grand Prix. Well, he wanted Michael Schumacher because he came to Spa. Suddenly, he looks at the receipts from Spa, and he has 20,000 people extra on the gate at Spa because Corpen where he lived, was just across the border. And suddenly, a German interest in Formula One, Bernie just suddenly then realised, hey... I've missed a trick here. I need a German driver. Now I've got to find him a seat. So he rang up Flavio and he told Flavio to put him in the car. Flavio said, Bernie, sorry, mind your own business. Go away. I'm putting Nelson Piquet in the car. He said, what? So he wanted Nelson Piquet. Tom Walkinshaw, who was also there, he wanted Brundle. And Bernie got them together, including me, in the Villa d'Este in Italy and cracked all our heads together. I got a few quid out of letting Michael go. Flavio was told that he had to get rid of, um, uh, to make a, a seat available, and, uh, and Brundle didn't get the drive. So um, that's how Michael Schumacher wound up in Benetton. It's clear. Bernie Eccleston instigated that. He created that. No matter what anyone else tells you, that's what happened. So it's nothing to do with the contract. You got a few quid out of it, and therefore you were prepared to let him go. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, I did fight it in the court where I think was very lucky. I lost a court case in Britain. Um, on what grounds? On the grounds that we could not withhold the person's right to be able to make a living. The judge was very clear. He was very sympathetic towards the situation, and he understood that I was trying to protect the team. And my, but he realized that to find another driver, and we had spare drivers or whatever it was, shouldn't be a problem, whereas... Uh, traditionally you, you cannot stop somebody the right to earn their living irrespective of how much that may be anyway uh, the injunction failed uh, and then that night you know was in my mind thinking my god what's going to happen we just forget it we've lost it move on and then I thought of another little we'll call it a scam but I rang up Roberto Moreno who had won the Formula 3000 championship with Gary Anderson who was our designer at Jordan and I said look Roberto it's simple and I don't want to mince my words here but you're out and I'm telling you it's best that you know this because you're going to be replaced by Michael Schumacher because they're not going to replace Nelson Piquet and you're going to be out of a drive they're going to offer you some money that uh, I'm sure but I have a solution would you be happy to be part of that because you're going to have to make the application and I explained to him that he needed to go with an Italian lawyer 
and place an injunction in the Italian courts prohibiting Benetton from selling off his seat. In other words, protecting him and his contract to his rightful right to drive that car for the remainder of the season. And what do you think happened? The Italian judge approved the injunction, so now Benetton had a choice. They could never run three cars, because they're not allowed to, so they had to come to Roberto and me for a deal. And so that made me happy in the end, because they, you know, to see them squirm a little bit was fun, uh, because they made me squirm, and it was our own little way, so we got paid out of it a little bit, some compensation, and as it happened, Roberto Moreno drove that race for us, which was kind of fun but we knew what the inside track and Tom you're squeezing all these information from me I'm not sure I've told anyone that before I've never heard it before thank you Eddie I'll keep squeezing if I might but uh, the moment Schumacher drove your car for the first time was it obvious to you that you had someone very special on the books or, or was he a bit of a slow burn and took him a while just instant like switching on a light instant bang 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 you just you know, when you have a driver who's never driven a Formula 1 car before, on a circuit you've never been before, you know, normally you would expect somebody to be tentative, uh, bed themselves in, not do something silly, because they didn't know how good they were, they didn't know... But this was like out of this world. You cannot believe how quick he was. Even when you were testing at Silverstone, I think it was the week before. I didn't even go to the test initially until my team manager rang me and said, listen, there's something wrong here because this guy is so quick. Can you please check that the circuit that we're running on is exactly what we've normally ever run on and they they haven't shortened it or haven't done anything with it. So I I thought he was joking. So I went over to see and there it was. For as plain as daylight, it was fantastic. What Michael Schumacher was able to do in a car was simply awesome. Okay, so that's 1991. Uh, you then get the Sassel money that we talked about a little bit earlier. And you're kind of set fair then, aren't you? Not really. We were always on a wing and a prayer. But, you know, that was half the fun of it, you know, just about. And the great thing was, we only ever spent what we had or we thought we'd have. So at the beginning of the year, I had planned in my mind what I thought I could get from there and I'd get from there. And maybe I might get a bit of a sponsor there or whatever it is. And... I'd always hold back 10%, and they thought I was a real, real tight bastard. But, you know, these things happen. Uh, I'm talking about the staff, for example. But the simple thing is, when you get to September, and you need to up the game of the car, and when you want to make a few little performance changes, they all cost money, whether it's aero, whether it's uh, technical, whether it's mechanical, doesn't matter. The fact is that you could want to maybe do more testing. And... I always felt that that 10% was so clever, holding it back uh, and making them sh- know, and talking about the engineers, the designers, because every engineer and every designer will have you bankrupt if they can because they will spend everything in the bank. They, it doesn't even register with them that you know, there has to, the, the, the well can run dry. Um, and and I, I don't begrudge them that thought because they're not, that's not their skill set. Their skill set is making the best, quickest possible car that they can do. And that's why, you know, these two factors, um, the commercial people will never agree with the engineering department in any Formula One team. And I was very much the commercial side. And a very important person said to me once, he said, Jordan, don't ever win championships or anything like that because as soon as you do, it's a label on you and you can only go down from there. Just be the underdog biting their heels. Very clever he was too. Who said that, Eddie? I'm not sure if I should tell you that, but um, I'm he was a man who had tried to sack me from Barclays, uh, the cigarette company. His name was Jimmy Rambuchesky. He was the marketing director of BAT, a hugely intelligent but straightforward guy. I mean, when he hit you, he hit you between the eyes straight away, so there was no mincing any words. But he is a marketing genius, and he was the person who made me realize, let's not go too boot big for our boots here. Let's just kick what we can kick and play as well as we can. And every now and again, we might get lucky, and that's truthfully what happened. Okay, so is it fair to say that 99, 1999 was the zenith for the team? It was the highest point. Frentzen was flying in the car. He won a couple of races. You finish third in the constructors. You finish third in the drivers with Frentzen. After that, it kind of 
well, from those great heights, you're only sort of going one way when you've got the likes of Ferrari and McLaren and Williams around in those days. So, well, there was Toyota and there was BMW, there was everybody there. And still we were able to be the match. What we couldn't compete against is the non... There was never going to be as much um, uh, racing dollars around without the likes of Marlboro or Benson and Hedges or Bartley's or Camel, which traditionally loved us. And so uh, I could see that our revenue stream was uh, deteriorating. Um, drivers who had money were not to the level that I felt that I wanted to be at. And you know, I remember what Bernie always said, Jordan, um, better to go and lucky than rich. Get the hell out of here. And that's what I did. When did he say that? Well, he said that when he realized that um, uh, the final, um, you know, there was uh, lots, of, lots of different scenarios um, in the anti-tobacco law. And so we came up with uh, bitten and hisses and be on edge and all of the other little uh, things which were clever. And we got lots of publicity out of it. But when, the, you know, when there was a blanket um, curfew and the whole thing was stopped, uh, we could say that, you know, maybe leave some room for somebody else to come in and let's see how they do it. And uh, that's what happened. So I, I, one of the great things I would have to say, in fairness to George, it was, it was a fun journey. And it, it, could I have written it any better? Probably not. How rock and roll were you really? Was it all marketing or was it genuine? Was it parties till two o'clock in the morning every day? Never. The thing about it... You're saying um, that with a straight face too. I'm not sure we were ever a two o'clock type of person. Um, it was four o'clock. I love rock and roll. I still play and I have my band and it's one thing that gives me the greatest buzz. Um, make plenty of mistakes. Most of them, most people don't know, hopefully. Um, but, you know, still love gigging and I play a lot these days, probably more than I, I probably should do. Um, but uh, it, it's... it's has always been a part of my life, that little crazy music scene. And um, as a result, the people came to the Grand Prix. Most of the people in the rock business came to Jordan, um, either through invitations or uh, magnetized to, to us, you know, and um, they could understand um, uh, the ethos. Everything about Jordan had that little edge. But, you know, that was there to f not necessarily to fool a lot of people, you know, Ron Dennis could never get over it. And he said, when are you ever going to grow up and be serious? And, you know, that was perfect because we were so serious behind that facade. There was something wickedly competitive, such a desire to beat McLaren and everybody else that they, the people on the outside thought, you know, they just don't know what they're doing. And um, so from that point of view, uh, that was perfect for us. So, so they, they would say, oh, you know, Ron would say to sponsors that if we were ever trying to get a sponsor, said, oh, Jordan, they're not even close to being serious. And that was perfect. I loved it. I love Ron for that. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but the highest point was that 99 season. And did you realize that you were never going to scale those heights again? Is that why you realized, was it at that point that you realized you needed to get out? Well, I remembered what Rambicheski had said, and we were so close to possibly winning that championship. Uh, I mean, Hockenheim in 99, when we were, what, 15, 20 seconds leading with a very short distance to go to the race, and Fisichella, one short stop, uh, and turned, switched the car off, and it never came back on. And um, that's life, you know? It's life. It doesn't matter finished third I bet it mattered at the time oh listen are you telling me we, we to win this race here 20 years ago at Spa we weren't unbelievably lucky of course but you know you have to be there to be able to benefit from the good times and the lucky times but of course you're going to have some unlucky times I mean I, I think about Frenson and the reason why I think he should have won the championship we were leading in Canada the same year uh, and a brake disc exploded with three laps to go. Um, you know, but in those days we had no money. We were using, we were using old disc brakes. brakes. Um, you know, our people used to help them. We used to have them reconditioned and we did... Well, I'm not saying we ever, ever, ever had a, a dangerous car. Not for one minute, but we had to make sure we got the maximum life out of each part. So, any regrets that you got out? 
any part of you, as we speak here at the Belgian Grand Prix, any part of you wish that you were still involved, still with your name above the door? I don't think I'd be alive. I think it's a young man's sport. And I think, you know, when you look at the pressure that people like Zach Brown must be under, uh, and then you look at Toto uh, with all the great success that he's had. But at the end of the day, um, one has to understand that, 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 you know, in terms of Toto, he's got the whole backing of Mercedes behind him, and it is somewhat easier. And I've described earlier on in this chat about the levels of stress and what people can stand, and the stupid things that people do when they have uh, so much stress on their back that they can't think straight. Um, and I fear, had I not got out in 2004, um, I don't know whether I'd be here today. Did it uh, make you ill? Did the stress I, of no, running no, no, into I, me? I, I remember I'd only ever been ill. Formula One made me ill at the beginning. In 91, um, I, I, I had never uh, a medical issue until then. And um, it, it uh, don't necessarily need to talk about it, but I had a medical issue in 91, and it was absolutely directly, 100% directly linked to stress. Um, uh, because of the pressure, responsibility, how onerous it is, not just in yourself, but as I've mentioned, staff, their families, your own family, your own children, you know, I can't possibly tell you, it's just so horrific, the stress. Whether it's there now or not, I don't know. Now, you've always been a good talker, so it wasn't a surprise for me to, when you made the move into broadcasting, with first with the BBC, now with... Uh, Channel 4 in Formula 1. How much do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy the adrenaline of live TV? I do. I think it's... It, it's, it's Because I, the role I have now is a slightly different role. Um, I, not necessarily Mr. Angry, but you know, some people call me Mr. Angry because I'm inclined to rip somebody. I mean, if I think that Williams or McLaren are doing a particularly bad job, I, I'm the one who says it. Um, and I'm castigated for it but you know it's what I believe and I say you know how can somebody great like McLaren be where they are in life uh, it shouldn't be and um, so most people are not going to say that but you know me as a team boss knowing how bad I was at times and knowing how reasonably good we were um, I'm, I feel qualified to be able to say that because when I was racing I absolutely revered McLaren and whatever anyone thinks about Ron Dennis, let me tell you, he won championships. He got unbelievable drivers. Just look at the record. And now look at where they are and what has happened to them in the last five, ten years. Just not the same team. So if I'm the one coming out and saying that, which um, I'm encouraged to do, by the way, by either the BBC and now, of course, with, with, with Whisper and Channel 4, um, they are the ones that are saying to me, you know, Eddie, say it how it is. Don't flower it up, don't flower it down. Just tell us your opinion. And once it's my opinion, then, you know, it's only me that can take the hit. But would Eddie Jordan, the team boss, be saying that the same thing? I don't oh, think I would. was brutal behind the door. My God, the things that used to be said were horrible, shocking, but I felt it needed to be said because sometimes you need to kickstart some brilliant person who's just not delivering for themselves, for the team, or for the sponsors. And you need to be absolutely clear, but fair, in your criticism. Look, Eddie, finally from me, in a Formula One context, what is your legacy? Um, some people will probably look to the rock and roll image and think that was it. I think... The yellow car of Jordan, of course, when I say the yellow car, my favourite of all time, of course, was the 7-up, the, the Michael Schumacher car. That was a very pretty car. But uh, I think my legacy is that I was able to come into it with very little, uh, and I left it with more than I came in. However, that's not important. In that time, every single member of staff got paid, every single supplier got paid, and generally, where possible, absolutely on time. And I think nowadays, with the struggle and the financial pressure on all of these big teams, they're all spending more money than they've got. And, you know, Bernie Eccleston was so clear about that. The problem with Formula One 
they spend more than they ever could hope to get and that puts massive pressure on you and it's only in life as it goes on do I realize how how clever that was such a statement it's a great thing and I by retaining the 10 percent gave the team the chance to fight later on in the season so the legacy was that I left with a clear conscience without owing anyone any money. What did Bernie say to you when you left? What were the last things he said in a, in a work context? I think he still says it, which is complimentary. And, you know, he, he always says, Formula One is a, a worse place without you. I mean, I still, you know, we talk about Force India and the troubles that they're going through. I still believe that that's my team. Uh, indirectly because I think about 70% of the staff are still the Jordan staff and they've had a tough time you know with Schneider and Midland and VJ and different not knowing whether uh, there was always going to be enough money and then um, you know the orders of VJ in particular and uh, extradition orders and many things must have put a lot of people and their staff and their families and schools and everyone else under a certain amount of pressure. Now I think uh, each of those people that I mentioned, both Schneider, Midland, Collis and more recently um, uh, VJ, of course I have no problem with them and I wish them well and I think what they've done under the circumstances has been remarkable. The achievements of Force India, when you think about how little they've had over the last 10 years, is absolutely staggering. Yeah. So let's hope under the new, new regime, and I can tell you that in terms of the man committed to success, Lawrence Stroll will make an amazing job here. Uh, look what he did with Tommy Hilfiger. Look what he did with Michael Kors. Look what he did with all the brands that he's been involved in. The man has a Midas touch. And if he can put 10% of that touch into this team, this team will be absolutely great. Well, Eddie, I feel we could talk forever. Um, but I think the time has come for you to go and uh, play some music. Thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure. As always, Tom, delighted to see you. Well, there you have it. EJ talks about the luck of the Irish, and he certainly had his fair share. But Formula One is also a sport in which you can make your own luck, and he did that too. His tenacity and opportunism forced open doors that might otherwise have remained closed. I think F1 misses his larger-than-life character and his ability to draw people in. But he's moved on, and as he embarks on his eighth decade, he isn't slowing down. So thanks for your time, EJ. Next week, I'll be chatting to another big name from F1. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Beyond the Grid to ensure you don't miss out. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and your favourite podcast app. And just because this week's podcast has come to an end, don't let the conversation end. Drop us a line using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid, and you can reach me on Twitter at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.